call the roll. Commissioner Bernstein? Here. Commissioner Grossberg? Here. Commissioner Flores Weisskopf? Here. Vice President Kaplan? Here. President Ruttenberg? I am here also. Thank you, everybody. I uh, hope everyone is well. Uh, we'll go to additions to the agenda. Are there any additions to the agenda? Uh, if you would like to talk about the Ravinia Fire Station, we certainly can do that. Let's do that, please. Okay. Uh, would you like, uh, I, I think we need a, a motion and a second to add it to the agenda. I move. Before we do that, before we do that, Brian, did you confirm with the city that this is okay to discuss an open session? Yes. Okay, fine. I'll move to talk about the fire station. I second. All, let's just do a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Oppo any opposed? Motion carries. Executive Director Rooms. Okay, so I, I whipped together some, some real quick visuals just to make sure uh, everybody is uh, clear on what we're talking about. So I'm hoping, uh, what screen are you seeing right now? Are you seeing a blank screen? So far. Okay, <laughs> good. Now you should see Brown Park. Um, Actually, it looks green. It is green, which is a good thing. Uh, it's prob it probably uh, doesn't have snow anymore, too. But uh, obviously not real time. But yes, this is Brown Park, uh, which is just on the intersection here, Roger Williams in Burton Avenue. Um, and then the Ravinia Fire Station uh, is right kind of across the street there. Um, and then if, if you know, you're obviously familiar with this area, the train station is is right up here uh, across the way. And then this drive goes to the other end of, of Brown Park. But right now this park is really just uh, a sign that's in the middle there. Um, and then uh, these these sidewalks uh, and kind of a cut through there. And, the, and it's, so it's a pretty passive park. And um, as I'm sure uh, our board has heard uh, over the past few years, um, the city has been looking into uh, renovating this fire station. It was originally built in 1929, so uh, it was renovated from a single family home. It is a, a very old building, and um, uh, the way I understand it is uh, it does not meet the, the, the needs as they see fit for uh, the fire station, and they did extensive um, uh, exploration of, of a potential new site uh, but when uh, they did all their community meetings and all their studies, uh, they determined that this location would remain to be the best site for the city of Highland Park to keep a fire station. So uh, their council uh, did approve uh, design and engineering uh, to rebuild the fire station in this same location. Uh, but obviously, uh, when they do the construction of the new fire station, uh, they need a place uh, to temporarily put uh, their um, employees, uh, their fire truck, uh, their ambulance, uh, and a few other things. So they have requested from the park district uh, to uh, lease uh, basically for a uh, dollar um, this uh, space, which is Brown Park. So during their construction, um, I, I did a, provide a memo to the park board uh, that was from the city manager, which kind of outlined what their initial request is for the park district to consider. Um, and again, this is regarding fire station 32, uh, the Ravinia district. And um, basically uh, I got a, another visual here, uh, Contextually here, here's Roger Williams and here's Burton. So it's not the entire site, um, but uh, I'm not sure this is exactly per uh, scale, but uh, they are looking um, at a 50 by 35 apparatus bay, 24 by 56 uh, trailer. Uh, so th that's this right here, 24 by 56. That's the living quarters. This is where uh, the uh, the staff, the uh, firemen will, uh, fire uh, staff will be uh, staying. Uh, there's also this construction trailer, uh, which they would put there for the construction uh, that is taking place across the street. Uh, then this apparatus bay uh, would hold their fire engine and their ambulance and up to uh, four to five 
vehicles for their employees. Um, so uh, obviously they would have to pour a concrete pad in this area uh, uh, that would be rather deep to accommodate um, those uh, heavy vehicles. And um, this uh, would, uh, the term uh, of this would be as soon as uh, November of this year that they would uh, be requesting this. Uh, construction would likely uh, begin shortly after that uh, to get this set up. And then uh, most of the construction for the actual firehouse would be in 2022. Uh, so uh, this would go all the way through April 30th of 2023, uh, wh at which point they would restore this park back to its original state. Um, so some of the initial terms that they're suggesting, again, a lease fee of $1 for the term of the lease. Um, uh, and then they'll be placing these temporary structures. Uh, obviously, uh, they will provide electricity, water, sewer, and gas, uh, which will be paid for uh, by the city. Um, of course, they'll maintain insurance during the term of the period. Uh, and um, really, uh, they'll provide uh, and take care of all the maintenance of the site during the lease. And uh, um, other than that, um, what they would suggest is if there's no uh, opposition or significant questions that the board has tonight, uh, if there's consensus uh, from the board to uh, allow this, what they would do is they would have their uh, council draft up an agreement um, and uh, would work with the park district on that agreement to eventually present it to the park board for approval. So really it's just uh, tonight looking for consensus uh, to allow the city to move forward um, with drafting that agreement. Um, and if there's any questions, I can pass them along to the city and report back. That's all I have for a presentation. Very good, Brian. There we go. There I unmuted. So let's see if there's any questions starting with Cal. Um, I, I really don't have any questions. I just have some comments. Um, the first comment would be with regard to the agreement. Um, I would obviously, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll let you guys draft the language, but obviously the city, I assume, will restore the site to its previous uh, uh, condition upon once they surrender possession. I assume that's correct, right? Correct. Okay. So my only, my only question, and this is really for the lawyers out there, I'm just curious why they decided to do this as a lease rather than a license, because in the past when the park district has allowed other parties and either, either other pro, uh, property owners or even the city to use park district property in a temporary basis, it's done under a license agreement rather than a, than a lease because a lease has all their kind of connotations regarding the uh, landlord tenant uh, statute. So um, I just want the attorneys to be comfortable when they review this, that, that the lease is a proper form rather than a license. Otherwise, I have no problem with this. Thank you. Terry? Yeah, I had the same question about leases and licenses. Actually, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, you know, obviously, I feel if they need it, uh, we're here to give it to them. We're not really using the park that much. Uh, Brian, you described it as basically a sign. Uh, I guess we could talk about that more later. So um, certainly it's good for the community. I'm sure it's great. Thank you, Lori. Uh, yeah, well, you know, even if it's just a sign, it's still green space, which we need to protect. So the fact that the city is willing to, uh, to get it back to its natural state, I think that's a fabulous um, um, term. Um, and I think the fact that it's a safety measure, I, I don't, I don't have a problem with this at all. Great, Brian. I have no problem with it. Has anybody run it by the neighbors? Uh, so the 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 city obviously um, uh, has run the renovation of the fire station by the neighbors, but I, I honestly don't know uh, if they. Uh, their first step was to 
Um, I believe they explored numerous locations and their first step was to make sure that we were okay with it. But, you know, obviously being the city, I'm assuming they will do their due diligence with the neighbors. Okay, otherwise I think it's- Yeah, I can jump in uh, since I live like at the top of the screen. Um, they have sent, had community meetings about this location um, and okay. the community did not want the fire station moved out of this part of town. All right, then as Lori said, it's a loss of green space, but they're putting it back, I have no problem with it. All right, I just would like to um, suggest that we um, might want to benefit from them bringing electricity to that portion of the property and that at the end of the term, maybe the, the power is stubbed to a box on the property that we could then use later on. Um, but the other thing is, do we want to ask the city to pay for our legal counsel to uh, prepare the agreement? That's a question for the commissioners. Um, I'll go first. I, I don't think it's going to be that complicated of a document. So I don't, I really don't think we need to have them pay our fees. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at this drawing though, as I look at it again, um, I just want to make sure um, that uh, public works takes a look at this because you do have two curb cuts pretty close to each other with the driveway into the parking lot and this fire truck. And I know the city is very, um, they're, they're, they, they regulate that. So um, I just want to make sure that they, their engineers sign off on where the curb cut is going to be located and that it's safely, it's far enough safely away from the drive aisle coming out of that parking lot because eventually people will be going back downtown and using that metro par parking lot to park their cars. So uh, just make sure that the, the city engineer signs off on that. Okay, Terry. I was worried about the curb cuts too. So thanks for bringing that out, Cal. Um, no, I'm good. Uh, Lori. Yeah, Barty, what is the cost for, for to draw something up? Uh, it, you know, we can probably get by an under a thousand dollars, I'm sure. Oh, I don't think it's too much to ask for them to split it. Well, we can ask. Mm -hmm. I think that would only be, I think it would only be fair. Brian Kaplan? We're, we're giving it for a dollar. Sure. Brian Kaplan? Questions, I'm good. Okay. All right. Consensus, I think, is to proceed with the lease with the city for, or, or the license, as the case may be, for the um, Brown Park for the fire station. I guess knowing that if it takes longer than the term, there should be extension rights in there uh, for the city to continue to work until they get it done. Okay. We'll go to public comments for items on the agenda, which I guess we might have wanted to end first. Is, do we have any comments from anyone, Brian? Uh, no, we do not. And we do not have any attendees uh, that are here to make public comment. So the answer is no. Okay. I want to test my raised hand. Oh, it worked. How about that? Okay. So now we'll move on past that to the consent agenda. Brian Rooms. Uh, we're just looking for a, a approval. So uh, just uh, a uh, motion and a, and a second is all we need. Move for approval. Second. Uh, okay, Roxanne, please call the roll. Commissioner Bernstein. Aye. Commissioner Grossberg. Yes. Commissioner Flores Weisskopf. Aye. Vice President Kaplan. Yes. President Rottenberg. Yes, the motion carries. Thank you. Now we'll visit the beach management plan update with manager Schwartz, who will introduce Margaret and Jacob of Smith Group. Can you hear me? Barely. Barely. But we know. That Can you hear me now? Like we hear you now, yes. Just like on whatever that cell phone service is. All right, um, so uh, tonight I'll be presenting or I will be introducing, like you said, Smith Group. But um, before I do, I'm just gonna give a quick overview. Uh, the beach management plan was awarded uh, or it was uh, based on an award, a grant award uh, from the Illinois Coastal Management Program. And it is uh, 
the grant award was to develop a plan to identify practical management strategies for the park district lakefront properties uh, to be more resilient to climate change. So um, we've developed strategies tailored to each site and we're going to share those with the board and the community tonight or to the board first. And then tomorrow a video presentation will be posted to the website and community members will have the opportunity to comment on the plan. So tonight we're not looking for approval of the plan. Uh, we expect to return to the park board on March 30th uh, with, the plan, with the updated plan for approval. So before I pass it on to Jay and Margaret, I just quickly want to share the intent uh, when we applied for this grant, uh, it is a plan that is really providing guidance uh, for responses to maintenance, um, strategies um, to guide our steward stewardship of our properties. What it's not, it, it does not cover lakefront amenities and it does not address lakefront activities. So it's primarily a maintenance and operations uh, document. So with that, I will turn it over to Jay and Margaret. And I hope you guys have, if you can share your screen. Brian, Great. Brian, before you turn over, can you give us like a, a, a 15 second overview? Cause she was breaking up. I didn't hear, I heard like every fourth word. Oh yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm sure Margaret and, and Jacob will give a, a pretty good overview, but this was based on a grant that we received uh, and it addresses uh, the bluffs and the, uh, the natural aspects of our beach to make sure that we're addressing uh, global climate change or any different changes in the environment uh, that would affect uh, the environmental health of our, of our lakefront properties. Okay. So, um, All right, thanks. Okay, sure. Good evening, everybody. This is Jay. Are you able to hear me okay? Are there thumbs up? Perfect. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And is everybody able to see my screen? Is my screen projecting for you? Good. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, <clears throat> we're uh, happy to present this beach management plan. As Amalia indicated, the intent of this plan is really to identify some recommendations relative to maintenance and operation in terms of how the beaches have been affected and are affected by one high lake water levels uh, as, as, um, as the, sort of a little bit of discussion prior to the meeting starting, you all are aware the Lake Michigan has been high. It's been historically high in 2019 and 2020. And then obviously we have, um, when you couple that with some of the climate change impacts that can have some pretty significant effects on the lakes or on, on the, I'm sorry, on the beaches and the bluffs. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Amalia already made this clear, but this was a grant funded project. We, we took a look at four of the beaches, um, the four beaches that are managed by the Park District, Moraine Park, Park Avenue, Boating Facility, Millard Park, and Rosewood Park. And as we've already discussed just briefly, um, climate change coupled with the high lake water levels have had some pretty significant impacts on the beaches. Across all of the beaches, the dry beach area is diminished. And that's primarily because just the lake water levels are higher. There's less beach area because the volume of water being held in the lake, you know, if you, it's like filling a bathtub, you fill the bathtub a little bit higher, there's just that much less uh, area along the side of the rim of the tub. And that's what's happening. We have li a less dry beach areas. But when you compare, when you pair that less dry beach areas with some of the impacts of climate change, increased storm intensities, increased storm frequencies, greater wave height, it can have some significant effects. Most notably on the beaches has been, in some cases at some of the beaches, and we'll see this as we go through and look at the beaches, there's been some erosion that has taken place at some of the beaches. There's also been some attack on the toe of the bluff. And uh, at Moraine, um, parts of Park Avenue, Millard, uh, and really not so much at Rosewood, uh, there have been these toe attacks and that's because when there is less dry beach area between the shore and the bluff, there's less beach area to eat up the waves before they hit the toe of the bluff. And my screen is, there we go. 
So as we as we indicated, the purpose of this plan was to preserve and protect the long-term access and use of the beaches, to establish some guidance for responses to storm events, to identify appropriate routine management strategies for the sand, the shorelines, and the beaches, and to then outline what we anticipate would be expected um, agency approvals associated with the recommendations provided. I'm not going to hang here. Uh, since you all are all on a first name basis with Margaret, I think you've probably been through some of this education before. So I don't think you probably need it from me. Um, but uh, just to, I'll be very brief to say that the beaches and the sands are subject to cross shore and longshore transport, that um, the predominant direction of transport here in Highland Park is north to south. So the wave. The waves hit the um, beach obliquely, but predominantly waves are coming out of the north, which results in sand being transported to the south. So sand from um, Highland Park is being primarily transported south of Highland Park. And, and right now, um, many of the beaches are sand starved. There's just not enough sand coming from the north to, con to continue to feed the beaches at um, Highland Park. And this graphic just represents uh, what I said earlier, that when lake water levels are high, there's just not as much beach, as you can see here in this graphic, there's just not as much beach to protect the toe of the bluff from wave attacks during wave events or storm events. Now, when you couple that with um, some of the overland flow experiences that is also paired with uh, climate change, the amount of runoff, you can get these conditions where you get a saturated face along the face of the bluff erosion under the toe, and then you have subsidence and the bluff face will subside and collapse down towards the beach. And um, we'll show you this in a moment, but there had, that, that did occur this summer in, in um, Millard. Okay, just real quickly, um, the winds and waves, we, uh, Margaret and her team do a, an analysis. These are rose diagrams that uh, look at um, directions, but as I said before, predominantly waves are coming out of the north, northeast, Winds are really kind of all over, but there's not strong winds um, that would result in pushing sand back up onto the beaches. That's the takeaway. Most of the winds are coming out of the west. Um, these are mislabeled, so we'll get that switched. But um, the winds are predominantly coming out of the west and not out of the east. And so you're not having these big push of, of winds driving sand back up onto the beaches. And so, as I said before, many of the beaches um, become sand starved. So let's look at Moraine Park. Um, <clears throat> I hope most folks are familiar with the park. Um, we'll see just a couple images and we'll talk a little bit about what we saw on site as part of our analysis. Um, you, get, you can access the beach at Moraine Park via a trail system. Is everyone, if I move my cursor, are you able to see my cursor? Or let me try this. How about that? Can you see the laser pointer? Okay, good, thank yes. you. All right, so there is, a, there is a trail that leads you to the beach at Moraine. Um, you, you, you work your way down this bluff face. Whoops, I'm sorry. It doesn't like that. There we go. You move your way, you move your way down the trail and um, you come out along this uh, uh, ravine outfall at the north end of the beach. This beach is, is the park's dedicated dog beach, and it is primarily a recreational beach. No, there's no swimming there, um, passive recreation along the beach. One thing to note is that the trail to the beach was washed out um, in this portion right here in, in 2019. And so that this beach has been closed since 2019. It's not open to the public. Um, we did go down there as part of our study, but uh, currently that's closed to the public and that trail needs to be repaired before it can be open to the public. This is what that beach looks like from the lakeside. It's pretty narrow right now, it's 10 to 12 feet wide. Again, that dry beach area is narrow because of the high lake water levels, but a couple things have happened as a result of that. Because the, the beach area is narrow, there have been some wave attacks on the toe of the bluff. The bluff is right behind this yellow line that's shown here. And so there have been some wave attacks on that toe of bluff. There has been some erosion that's taken place there. And there's a lot of vegetation uh, on this slope. In this particular instance, there's not a lot of structure. There are no structures on this ravine behind the slope. So um, if the bluff were to fail, 
there are no structures on top of the slope or anything like that that would be in risk. Uh, you can see here in this photograph what it looks like when there's been some uh, eating at that toe. Uh, the other thing that I wanna just point out here is that the water quality is sampled at this beach. It's sampled by the county and sampled, um, I believe it's weekly now. I can't, off the top of my head, I've forgotten now which, which ones are weekly. But, um, and, and what you can see here is you see the number of closures the number of days closed, and then we compare that with the average number of closures and the average number, excuse me, the average number of days closed for the county. So big concerns that we identified at Moraine were that the bluff toe is exposed to direct wave attack. That's because of this narrow beach, as I've said before, um, the issues associated with climate change. And, um, and because the beach has been closed, there are actually a lot of trees on the beach here today. There's a lot of debris on the beach. When this beach gets reopened, once the trails open, there will need to be some cleanup of that beach as a result of just, it's just been closed and there hasn't been a need to go out there and maintain it because people can't get to it anyway because of the trail being closed. The next beach we looked at was the Park Avenue boating facility. That's really split into two beaches. There's a North Beach here north of the, of the water treatment plant, and there's a South Beach here at this facility. <clears throat> Access is along Park Avenue, which brings you in here. It's a one-way street, and then you come back out on Egandale. There are a couple parking lots here, um, one, one large parking lot here, uh, and then there will be some additional parking opportunities, I believe. Uh, Amalia can speak to this more, but I believe that that will start this summer. There's some additional parking opportunities. This is, um, this is also a, a passive recreational beach. There is no swimming at this beach. To be clear, there's only swimming at, at, at Rosewood. Um, so uh, people are in the water. They're not really supposed to be swimming. There's no lifeguards here. There's also a series of, uh, of um, structures out here, some groins that help protect the sand. The big takeaways from this beach are that um, the Northern beach is much wider obviously than some of the other beaches we're gonna see here today. And that's in part because of this projection of the water treatment plant, which projects out into the lake. And it's actually preventing some of that sediment transport loss. So what's happening here is that some of the sand is being protected from loss and some of the erosional losses because it's, it's hitting this projection and stopping its movement south. At the south end, at the south beach, this is primarily used for boat launching. And there is the, the concrete structure here for um, additional boat, trailered boat launch. This beach here really depends on, and I, I think you've already been through this with Margaret a few times, it really depends on this barge or some other type of groin structure if this were to go away for this beach to remain. If this structure were removed, a big, big sections or maybe all of this beach would potentially be eroded away without that protection. <clears throat> There have been some wave attacks and bluff attacks uh, over here, but uh, to be clear for much of Park Avenue, the bluff is way back here behind the rest of, of the, uh, behind the parking lot, behind the water treatment plant. And so there's really hasn't been a whole lot of impact on the bluff here at Park Avenue, a little bit of impact right down here associated with um, the Yacht Club and the Yacht Club parking lot. So this is, again, just looking at the, the Park Avenue boating facility. This is that North Beach. There is a ravine outfall that discharges right back here. It's a pretty big structure that discharges across the beach here. Um, <clears throat> and depending on the type of storm event you have, you can have some reeling and some erosion in your beach area here when this dis discharges across the beach. And then this is that South Beach that we just looked at in the plan view. Here's the barge that's really protecting that. If that barge was not here, you'd have big loss here. You can also see right here where there's construction fencing in this aerial photo right here. That's some of the tow attack that's taken place right here at the south end of the parking lot associated with the, with the yacht club. And has actually caused that to, portions of the parking, parking lot to have collapsed and eroded and um, it needs some repair. <clears throat> So the two ends of the park are affected very differently by the variable waters in the lake. As I said before, that North Beach, because of its orientation, because the water plant is right behind it on the south side of it, it's more stable, it's losing less sand, it's less prone to erosion because of that projection. And that South Beach is held in place by the large barge. One other thing of note, uh, one other comment of note here is that um, we'll see this really on all the bluff faces except at Rosewood, but 
This aerial photo highlights that historically the bluff faces were much less vegetated in part um, that was because the very year, early European settlement, a lot of this was still being, big sections of Illinois were still being burned or had been burned uh, so recently that there just isn't that much, wasn't that much vegetation left on the bluff faces. The bluff faces today in many cases are over vegetated and that over vegetation can help contribute to additional bluff face failure in part because the vegetation that's there is much shadier and denser than some of the perennial vegetation that would have been on the bluff faces historically. On to Millard Park. Millard Park is accessed through Ravine Drive. Um, Ravine Drive is a, a kind of a steep experience all the way down here and it takes you down to a, kind of a small parking lot. It's small, it's a nine, a nine car parking lot. It, it's not kind of small, it is small. A nine car parking lot. Um, <clears throat> you can also access Millard Park through the trail system. These trails are on the top of Bluff and they work their way down the Bluff face here at the backside of the Bluff onto right, right out, right where Ravine Drive hits the parking lot. Um, but all of these trails, all of these um, components up here are on the top of the Bluff. It also is split into, it also is split into two beaches, a North Beach and a South Beach, right here where there is a ravine outfall that discharges directly to the lake. Um, there's no beach in between this outfall at the time that we examine the site, no beach between this outfall and the lake, it discharges straight out. And you have this wider um, North Beach for, for very much the same reason that you do at Park Avenue where the structure of the outfall actually helps support the sand and prevent the sand from eroding. Whereas down here, um, there, you, you have a small groin here and then there's another groin that's just off this map but you can see there's quite a bit more erosion. This beach here is about 10 to 12 feet wide as a result of the lake, higher lake water levels. This beach here is wider and the bluff is back, is behind it much further until you get to the north end where you can see there's almost no beach area at the north end of this right now as a result of the high lake water levels. There's almost no beach area at the north end. And one of the things of important to note is that in 2020, we did see a subsidence at the north end that took place, that was up here, where you see these photos. There was a subsidence of the bluff face at the north end of Millard Park. Again, that's, in, that's due to not having the beach, the lake water levels are high. As a result, there's less beach area between the toe of bluff and the shoreline. So when wave run up and wave attack hits this, there's less beach to eat up that water more water is hitting the toe and that water combined with overland flow. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of residences that are just off this photo right over here. Potential stormwater issues associated with overland flow that might've saturated the face of this bluff and the erosion and undermining of the toe resulting in a subsidence, a fairly, fairly significant subsidence there uh, at the beach. And so you can see here at those residents, there's quite a bit of development back here behind it. And the bluff failure area is right here. That's the area we were just looking at, <clears throat> at Millard. Finally, the last uh, beach we looked at was Rosewood. This is your public swimming beach. This, as you all are, are probably familiar with, was redone in 2014 and 2015, went through some major revisions. A big part of those revisions was the placement of these big stone revetments out 200 feet out into the lake. Those stone revetments have really protected from a lot of the erosion that could have taken place out at this beach. And, and, and there still has been some erosion. We'll look at that. There was some erosion over here. We'll talk about that in a moment. But um, in most cases, there's quite a bit of beach area between the shoreline and the back of the bluff or the toe of the bluff, which is back here. And um, they've really done a, a pretty good job of protecting those bluff faces the, and the bluff toes. As I indicated, there has been some erosion. There was some erosion at the ravine outfall. You can kind of see it back here in this photograph uh, behind the yellow. There also was a little bit of undermining on the boardwalk right here. So sand was sucked out uh, from underneath the boardwalk in this location. Everything's fine back here, but there has been some erosion and some erosion impacts, particularly in this cove, in the interpretive cove, is where we saw the most erosion while we were on site. Again, this is a, this is a direct result of these high lake water levels exacerbated or and coupled with the more intense waves and the more intense storms associated with climate change. 
Uh, water quality is also measured at Rosewood and you can see um, the, the number of closures and the number of days closed compared to the average for all public beaches uh, in Lake County, Illinois. And then it's worth noting again, 2014, the beach was closed. That's why there's no data collection for um, closures or number of days closed during 2014. So just some general comments and then we'll get to the recommendations and I'll try to wrap this up so that there's questions. I wanna respect everyone's time and um, appreciate you giving us the opportunity to speak tonight. Climate change and human development have forever changed the lakes and the conditions of the lakes. Um, that said, what is happening at the lake shoreline, the higher water levels, those are natural. It's a natural cycle. It's, it's typically a five-year cycle and 2020 was year three. So we're, we're expecting to see water levels come back down in 2021 and 2022 in the lake. But when we have these high lake water levels and then you pair that with more intense storm events, you get these wave experiences that we have not seen in the past. Those are historic wave experiences in terms of the, the amount of distance that they can run up on a shoreline, the, the height of the waves that can come in and the impacts that those waves can have. All of the Park District of Highland Park beaches require some engineered solutions to maintain their existing conditions. They depend on, in, in, in most cases, they depend on these groins or at Rosewood, they depend on the, the stone revetment structures that were placed in the lake in order to maintain the sand, the sand beaches that you have there. We would expect that as the lake levels return to normal, we'll see more of the submerged beaches re-emerge. This is the south side of Millard Park um, looking south. This is that uh, outfall structure right here and right in front in the foreground. And that um, some of the sand loss because of cross sediment transport will be expected to decrease as well. We just won't see as much sediment being moved south out of your beaches. Any of the beach sizes that have a heavier grain sand are expected to um, uh, experience even less erosion. However, the bluffs that have been impacted by the high lake water levels and, and the subsequent storms, they can't be healed in the same way that beaches can be. Uh, it takes thousands of years and longer to form bluffs. Uh, we, we can't re-nourish bluffs like we can beaches. We can bring truckloads of nourishment sand out to the beaches. We can't do that for the bluffs. And we really need to identify protection strategies for the bluffs if we want those to remain. Those are especially important where we have structures at the tops of those bluffs. So jump into our recommendations for Moraine Park. Um, this beach is expected to stay in more or less a natural condition. And so we're not making any kind of significant recommendations relative to how we, ex how we would expect this to be maintained or protected. Um, we do anticipate that when the trail is reopened, there will be a need to um, do some monitoring on the bluffs out there really uh, pretty regularly, especially after any major storm or wave event. And then if there is evidence of significant toe erosion or things begin to look unsafe, uh, an expectation that that would be shut down until the safety issues are resolved, um, whether that's removal of debris or exploring um, opportunities for how we might resolve or uh, improve the safety of the bluff if there's significant erosion at the toe of that bluff. At Park Avenue Boating Facility, um, really, the first step here is um, repairing some of the existing buried revetment that was impacted by a higher waves, um, deeper wave runup that pulled some of the revetment away from the North Beach parking lot. Um, there's an opportunity to do some more planting at, at Park Avenue, especially as the lake recedes and the beaches will become drier. The opportunity for planting and establishing desirable native habitats will increase. And then we're making a recommendation to periodically review and evaluate the water quality at that large ravine outfall structure that's just north of the water quality plant. At the South Beach at Park Avenue Boating Facility, we're suggesting that um, if you want that beach to stay there, we need to maintain or replace that boat launch barge with either a structure or maintain that barge or something of a similar value or a similar length. Um, I know this is something that you have talked about at fairly significantly in depth with Margaret and I'm not gonna hang there um, for uh, other than to say, well, we're, we're making the same recommendation. Something needs to be done or you'll lose that beach. There's also some repair that needs to be done on that south end of the North Shore Yacht Club uh, that boat, par the parking lot there has been destroyed 
and um, significantly impacted by scour. That's a result of the wave run up and wash out um, from those waves and um, some repair needs to be done there. <clears throat> At Millard Park, um, this is where we saw the, the largest uh, subsidence on the bluff faces. We're suggesting that uh, a geotechnical review of the bluff needs to be completed to identify areas of bluff instability, especially after we've seen that large subsidence in 2020. Where possible and if necessary, we should move uh, some of those bluff top trails, structures and park furnishings back from the head of the bluff. So if there is additional subsidence that they are not threatened and they're not in danger. Um, if it's necessary to um, when things become dangerous, we need, we're recommending you put up fencing and signage prohibiting access and use. And um, because of the age of the groins here and that the sand beaches are really dependent on the groins here, we're making a recommendation that the groins are inspected annually to review if there are repairs or replacement needs associated with those groins. Um, we're also making some recommendations relative to um, some access opportunities here. I think the other big thing that's important to point out is that there is a sanitary sewer line that runs through the groins. That sewer line is below the water elevation. You can see the walls for the sanitary sewer line, but the line itself has not been exposed. And there's been no indication that the sign has been damaged or there are maintenance issues associated with it. We are suggesting adding um, coarser sand on top of that sanitary sewer line to ensure that it stays covered and protected. At Rosewood, uh, we're suggesting that there needs to be some a um, uh, couple things done to protect the existing structures that are there. Um, you want to do some restoration of the erosion that's taken place and some of the undermining. There might also need to be some protection, whether that's armored protection or other types of protection that needs to go in to ensure that those structures are not undermined in the future. I'm talking about the boardwalk area that was at the, the, at the um, west end of the parking lot next to the, um, uh, the Interpretive Cove. Um, <clears throat> we are also suggesting that because this is the, the primary um, swimming beach that uh, the park district develop and maintain a beach renourishment program and then identify areas of greatest concern. This becomes particularly important during periods of high lake water levels when, again, you saw that the beaches were in pretty good shape, but to be perfectly honest, there was some erosion that took place there. There was some steepening of the beaches because sand and sediment was being washed offshore during these high lake water level periods. We're also suggesting that there could be some ecological improvements here at Rosewood. I didn't talk about it earlier, but some of there had been some habitat areas that were restored in 2015. And um, it, again, uh, I keep, I sound like a broken record putting the blame on high lake water levels, but in climate change, but those have washed out in, and impacted some of those um, habitat areas that were established. Regulatory permitting is expected for any of the improvements at the beach, uh, for many of the improvements at the beach. Any work within the water is gonna require permitting. Any work adjacent to or within the creeks or streams or within the shoreline is gonna require permitting. The Army Corps of Engineers will require any a permit for any work done within the ordinary high water mark or changes to or improvements to existing or new structures in along the shoreline. Um, IDNR is going to require permitting for uh, ordinary high water mark changes to structures and for sand nourishment. And many of these permits that will be required will have a cross agency review process that will involve either the Army Corps, uh, IDNR, and, and almost all of them include IEPA. There are uh, a couple different types of funding sources that could be leveraged to exercise and complete some of these uh, recommendations we're making. There are state and federal grants, there are private funding sources, there's an opportunity to look at um, user fees, and also there's maybe opportunities to partner with other units of local government to see how uh, some of these projects might be funded collectively. I think in terms of the private funding sources, I'm not gonna go through the grants, but in terms of the pr private funding sources, it's worth noting that the Illinois Association of Park Districts manages and uh, maintains a list of possible grant sources. And OSLAD grants, which um, are on and off, I'm not sure how many folks on this call are familiar with the OSLAD grants. They were, um, they were available last year. They're not available again this year. 
um, they kind of go on and off depending on uh, the funding opportunity, funding cycles, but those can be used for um, uh, improvement to existing beaches. Our recommended next steps or prioritized next steps is starts with bluff monitoring. Uh, because of the impacts of the high lake water levels, because of the tow impacts that have occurred at Moraine and Millard and Park Avenue on that south end by the um, Yacht Club, we are suggesting that um, a bluff monitoring program should be established. That bluff should be inspected after all wave events or significant storm events and that a geotechnical analysis of the bluffs at Millard Beach be conducted. We're also suggesting that um, the park district coordinate with the city forestry department to define a bluff vegetation management plan that seeks to find a way to establish what is the appropriate amount of vegetation and how to manage the vegetation on the bluff faces. This is not an issue at Rosewood where all that, that restoration was conducted, but on your other three bluffs, there's just a lot of vegetation on those bluff faces. We're also suggesting to spend the time to and, uh, protect your existing infrastructure at Park Avenue and Rosewood. Um, you've got the parking lot area that was impacted and the revetment was some of the stones were sucked off the revetment at, on the, uh, at the parking lot on the north end of um, Park Avenue. You've got the parking lot damage on the south end by the Yacht Club. And then you, we had the damage or the undermining that took place at Rosewood. And we just wanna make sure we're protecting those the infrastructure you've invested that money in there. I apologize that my screen keeps advancing on me. We're also suggesting to develop a plan for ongoing water quality monitoring at the beaches. Um, currently those are being conducted by the county. The county is being funded by the state, but um, it, it seems that annually that money, uh, they're always being asked to do a little bit more with a little bit less. And at some point that money may become so diminished or may no longer be available. We're suggesting now is the time to plan for that if that were to take place. We're also suggesting to do some groin repair and replacement study. Those should be evaluated annually and then determine if there is repair or replace that needs to take place. To be perfectly clear, the Army Corps of Engineers is no longer permitting groin placement so if we find the groins at the beach is, is so significant that they need to be replaced, they will have to be replaced with a different kind of structure. A steel groin is not gonna be allowed or permitted by the Army Corps any longer. And as I said before, we're suggesting to develop this beach nourishment plan and budget for the beach nourishment at Rosewood Beach. With that, I will stop sharing my screen and um, Margaret and I will take questions. Thank you. Well, let's uh, first ask uh, for questions from our commissioners, and we'll start with Cal Bernstein, who is always the first up. There's a lot to digest. There's a lot of information that was just thrown at us. Um, um, I appreciate the, the thoroughness of the presentation. Um, I try to take notes. I don't think I did a very good job, but... Um, um, I think that um, you know, with what I found very informative is is the discussion with regard to Moraine Park and Millard. Um, you know, we've uh, talked. I'm, I'm frankly, I'm exhausted about how many times we've talked about Rosewood Beach and what's happening there. And and Margaret's probably tired of me asking questions about Rosewood Beach. So um, I think that um, I think at this point, I, I think that we have spent a lot of time. Um, uh, considering what needs to be done there. So I'm confident that working with Margaret and her staff and our, and our staff will be able to um, maintain and uh, preserve what we have at Rosewood. Um, with regard to Park Avenue, um, I think that uh, again, you know, as my short tenure as a liaison to the, um, to the working group down there, I know that a lot of those issues are being discussed and I have the utmost confidence in our staff and our liaisons, our current liaisons to that working group uh, to, to address the issues at Park Avenue. Um, what I'd like to actually focus on in my questions are is with regard to Millard, because um, that's, I guess, what I learned the most in that presentation of what's happening there, especially on the north side. And um, so my question there is, is I know that it's a natural area. I mean, you kind of mentioned that with Moraine Park also, but um, is since it's a natural area, um, I, I, I'm going to use the word heavy-handed because we, we did um, what I consider what, what we did at Rosewood, which was perfectly 
logical because it's our swimming beach, but it was a heavy handed type of um, protection system. I assume because it's passive both at Moraine and at Millard that you're not looking for a similar type of uh, a similar type of structures or any or, or similar type of, of effort, I should say, given to try to preserve and protect those bluffs. Uh, I mean, it's a long winded question, but um, I apologize for that, but I, I really want to focus on those two beaches. Sure, that's a great question. Um, I would say that we're, we're certainly recommending because of the erosion and the subsidence that took place that there is, we, we initiate a monitoring plan right away and we do at, at Millard absolutely do a geotechnical evaluation of the bluffs. And I think that geotech evaluation is gonna tell us more about the stability, the long-term stability of the bluff there. One of the things that's that's different about Moraine and Millard is that at the top of the bluff of Moraine, there's there's nothing. There's no trails. There's no public access up there. Uh, if the bluff face were to fail at Moraine, there's no loss of any kind of public access structures, trails, uh, any of that. You know, it's it's in a much more natural condition than Millard. So I think there are ways that you could approach the bluff face at Millard. Um, but w we just need to be aware that there are those risks at Millard associated with existing trails. There are, there's some historical structures at the top of the bluff at Millard. You've got that, um, that little pool that, that it's not a, it's not a, the garden, the water garden that's up there, that historic stone water garden that's at the top of the bluff at, at Millard. Um, there's benches along there. So there's this thought about what needs to happen. And then in addition, at the north end of Millard, you, you get you, you get kind of close to where there are some adjacent residences at the north end of Millard, and those are off property. Those they, they're they are not they are not behind your property. They are north of your property. But I think um, being a, a good steward and understanding um, what are the risks associated with the bluff face because of the structures, the the public access at the top of the bluff there is a little bit different than it is at Moraine. But but since the wave energy goes pretty much northeast to southwest, it, it would, would it be, am I making an incorrect assumption that there's there's less of a risk of um, whatever is done on the Park District's property at Millard impacting the neighbors to the north just due to the fact of the natural energy that, that, that travels northeast down the lake? No. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll jump in real quick. Um, uh, uh, Millard's, um, bluff is going to fail. The extent it's going to fail is currently unknown, which is why we're recommending that a geotech analysis is done. Bluffs do not repair themselves, unlike beaches, which move uh, in a cross shore on and offshore with rising water levels. The toe is gone on the north end of the bluff at Millard, which means it's going to fail so that it becomes stable again. Now, what that failure is going to look like, I, I can't say. I don't know if it's a surficial failure um, uh, to put it back into a stable profile or if it's a, a much more severe full front face failure, uh, which we have seen uh, within Illinois and Wisconsin over the past two years. That doesn't care about property lines. So if it fails at the very north end of Millard, it can extend northward onto the bluff of the private residence uh, to the north. So that is where uh, a geotech analysis will, will tell you how likely it is to have a full facial failure or if it is more superficial slumps uh, until it is back into its um, stable profile. So Brian, that brings up a very good point. If you can, I mean, I think we should do an analysis with while, while we're hearing tonight that, that, the, that there is a concern that, the, that the, um, the, the, the northern portion, the bluff in the northern portion of Millard may fail, may impact the neighbors to the north. Obviously, we have to determine what's our liability with regard to that. And I think, it, 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 I think it's, it'd be prudent for us to look into that in order to make sure that uh, I mean, Pedermo may have to be brought in this or whatever, but I don't want to see us having exposure. Uh, I, I think with regard to our neighbors and what our obli I'd like to know what our obligations are, number one, and number two, what our exposure to potential liability if that bluff does fail. 
um, I think that's something that should be looked into by our lawyers. But Cal, if I could jump in. Yeah. If the, I, th I think we have to understand the failure of the bluff is not a failure of the bluff south of the property line. It would involve the neighbor to the north of the property line and our property. And so perhaps this is an instance where we should reach out to the neighbor and have some discussion of what their concerns are. Uh, and I think if you notice in the picture, they have, I think they've installed riprap uh, as, a way of as a way of protecting their portion of the, the bluff, um, which may or may not be mar valuable enough to, to Absolutely. provide what they're doing. It's I very beneficial. I mean, it's something, I think that's a good point, Barney. I think that um, uh, obviously this, it's a team effort. We'll have to coordinate with the neighbor to the north. I just want to make sure that, that we have that dialogue happening. Yeah, I think the point uh, is we should have a dialogue with them uh, as good neighbors. And, you know, and, you know I, so, so maybe not everything has to be our cost either. Yeah, but that's your pressure. This Margaret, is Jay, no, I'm sorry. again, this is Jay again. I'll just emphasize that we're advice, neither Margaret or I are geotechnical engineers. And by the way, we don't have geotechnical data from this bluff phase. So. I think it's it, it starts to get hard for us to speculate what might or might not happen there because uh, that that gets out of our wheelhouse. But um, it's severe enough that we're saying you should have the geotechnical analysis done so we can all better understand what is happening there. Okay, so then I won't ask Margaret to break out a crystal ball to figure out exactly <laughs> what, the, what the timetable is and with those, I'm not going to um, go down that line of questioning them, Margaret. Okay. No, um, but but I guess the one one thing I will say is that timelines can be decades. So it is it is currently unstable because the toe is gone, but unstable bluffs can remain as they are for years and years. Uh, so it's not like there's a timeline within the coming months. It's not an imminent failure, but I can't tell you exactly what that is. And, and, a geotech would have better insight. Ballpark, what is it? How much is a geotech, and what would that cost us to do this? Uh, borings will cost somewhere in the six thousand dollar range, is what we've we've been dealing with in your area from ECS uh, Midwest is is typically who we hire to do that work. Uh, I would suggest at least two to three uh, for the borings, and then there is the analysis on top of that. Um, I can't say exactly how sure how much they're going to charge for your analysis, but the last analysis I got in Wisconsin was about twenty five thousand. And Brian, have we budgeted any funds to do that geotechnical analysis? Not right now. No. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that there is a sanitary sewer line at Millard that you're concerned about it being exposed. Whose line is that? North Shore Water Reclamation. Yeah. Correct. So whose obligation is it to make sure it's to make sure that it stays covered? Is it their obligation or is it ours? We would work with them. Okay. So that's something else you could take a look but, at. But but just for a point of information, Cal, and I'm not trying to interrupt you every second. No, that's all right. I, I appreciate it. I, I don't know much this is not something I don't know much uh, about. There is a sanitary sewer line that runs along the entire lakefront. And I'll just start at the edge of our property in Millard all the way down to Rosewood Beach, where it's then pumped up to the clavy plant. So, so, so is, it, is, it, is it in the in the water or is it at the toe of the bluff? It's depending on where you are at a particular moment. So uh, it runs, or, it, it, and, and they regularly inspect their, their lines. Um, and actually, we work together, though. I mean, um, and Barney's been to some of our intergovernmental meetings and and they attend and, and they talk and then and then we respond back and so um, you know we 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 talk with them every quarter at least um, more often than that probably to make sure that we're we're okay. looking they're guess, looking at their own lines and we're communicating if there's issues that we see. Yeah, it's one of the beauty features of the of the park at Moraine that as soon as you come down the path <clears> you're <throat> encountering a big concrete <laughs> box that is uh, um, an access point to their sewer line. Got it. Um, I appreciate the, your last slide regarding the next steps. I thought that was very comprehensive. Um, I, would, um, I would like to actually at a future meeting for um, our, our staff 
I don't know how much of those next steps we're actually um, undertaking already or what you're planning on doing. So, uh, I mean, I, I think th this is a very good start, but I'd like to know, um, you know, what, what I this, those are the next steps that, that, that uh, Margaret and, and Jake are, are, are recommending, what, what we're gonna do with, the, with those recommendations. So this is, this is a breathing document that is just not gonna just sit on the shelf. So it doesn't have to be done tonight, but at a future meeting. Um, and lastly, this is something we really don't talk about. I don't remember actually at really ever talking about this at a board meeting. And I know I'm looking this on my, my notebook, so the, the numbers aren't that um, large, but um, with regard to water quality, um, is there any concerns with regard to, you know, people are accessing our beach everywhere now, especially last year during COVID. Is there any concern about water quality? And I, it looked like some pretty big numbers at Rosewood. And again, I was, the numbers were kind of small on my screen, but um, is there any concern regarding that or is there something we should be doing that's more proactive or is that just the, the way the lake is? I would say that your numbers are, are not exceptionally high. You have, you have good, relatively good clean beaches compared to your neighbors in many ways. So I would say that your, the number of closures that you have and, and the, the length of those closures are not exceptionally high um, and, and something to be scared of or worried about. Are there other ways that you could um, increase the and prevent or, um, sort of dirtiness of the beaches? The, the, the primary issue with the beaches, it, well, let me back up. Many of the beaches around you that close are, are, those closures are associated with sanitary lines or sanitary discharges or accidental discharges of some, of some kind. Um, other types of closures are associated with um, with uh, seagulls and um, the, just just the amount of E. coli associated with um, seagulls and other passerine um, um, waterfowl that um, can can significantly impact beaches. And so, um, you know, there are strategies you could employ. You have beach, you have picnic areas at Rosewood, and that helps having designated picnic areas and and thinking about where and how food maybe is on the beaches can also help um, control the seagulls. And, and they tend to be the biggest issue when there's food, then you've got gulls. And um, so I think that's, that, one, that might be one other way you could help manage it. But right now, um, compared to your neighbors and, and kind of compared to the, the, the county averages, you're doing really well. You have clean beaches, you don't have, a, you don't have excessively high closures. Um, you, you've had an occasional event where you've had a, a big closure, um, but or, or closed for a long time, but not, not, not regularly. Um, that's all I have. Thanks, thanks again for a very impressive uh, presentation. Right. Terry, do you have anything to talk? Uh, any yeah, questions? I do. I do. Um, the alarm bells are going off in my head. Honestly, I think about this in a very existential way. I've only been a board member for four years and I certainly want, wouldn't want to be known as a board member that was here when the bluff slid into the lake sort of thing. And um, I'm just wondering um, if we should be taking a, a holistic look and, and this is a big question for Brian and his staff, but yeah, like what, you know, we're one of a few major lakefront towns, you know, so what does the lake mean to us and what are we willing to do to make, um, to make good on the promise of keeping our um, parks and lakes um, healthy and usable? And so I, I worry, I worry a lot. I, I, I remember, so uh, Cal, I'm glad you brought up um, Ravine, you know, um, because that's sort of my main drag and I and I've been the one harping a lot on um, on the dog park uh, path as well because they're both issues of um, ex access in some meaningful way. We have a park up north, but we can't even get to it, and so that that concerns me. And even though there may not be houses and other structures on the top of that, if we can't get down to the bottom, then what you know, what what good is it that we have it? So I, I just, I, I think we may need to take a very, very holistic look at our budget and to see um, what, what we would have to do, what it would take to 
put a all hands on deck uh, effort into saving uh, uh, or maintaining the bluffs to it. I mean, it, it, uh, Margaret, it was very frightening to hear you say in very concrete terms, the bluffs are failing. Now that might just be, you know, sort of a fatalistic look at everything on earth sort of thing. I don't know, but these are our bluffs and they're failing and it's scary to me. So, um, you know, in my mind, if, if it's black or white, if it's like ice skating rink bluffs, I really have to think about something like that. Or if it's water park bluffs, I have to think about that sort of thing. So that's sort of where this dizzying uh, sort of conversation is, is leading me. It's leading me down this spiral. Um, so anyways, I was mentioning, um, I call it ravine uh, moraine, um, and walking along the northern edge and looking inward at the bluffs. And I sent a picture to Brian late last summer, and I was just stunned to see what, um, what you are calling the toe. I just, either I didn't have access to that area because the beach had narrowed so thinly. Uh, I, finally, we had maybe a few uh, dry days and I was able to see that, but it's just, it's like caves in there. It's like uh, we might find brontosaurus bones in there or something like that at some point. It's like, um, it's quite scary. And then you have at the top of the bluff where the house was, you know, we have that whole area roped off trees, big, gigantic, institutional, 100, 200 year old trees look like they're soon to be falling into the lake. And it's just a, it's just a terrible prospect. So anyways, thank you for giving me a chance to just express my fears uh, there for a minute. And, um, and to just ask our staff to just kind of, if you haven't already, kind of what does this mean for us? And what, and do we have to rejigger um, sort of our priorities to start addressing this in a meaningful way. Because um, Cal, you had mentioned like we've talked um, Rosewood to death and, I, and, and, and we've done a lot of good there, obviously. That one was sort of light on criticism um, for this presentation. Um, but we have real issues at Park Avenue and we have real issues at Moraine. And so these four beaches uh, should, be, should be really, really way up on our priority list in my um, opinion. Uh, I wanted to ask about the, compared to other towns, you gave us a positive rating in terms of water quality. What do you give in terms of erosion and bluff and uh, sort of a, what the, the worst case scenarios that are going on on our beaches right now? I'll let Margaret answer that because she's probably more involved with other town <laughs> beaches than I am. Well, uh, w whether it makes you feel better or not, you are not alone. Uh, 2020 was historic high water levels and bluffs that haven't been touched in over 20 years. Um, so uh, there are many bluffs out there that had a bit of undermining. Some had had larger failures, uh, smaller failures. Um, the vegetation has just grown up over time because we just haven't had the natural process that is bluff slumping. Uh, without bluffs slumping and entering, entering our littoral system, we wouldn't have new sand. This is a natural process. So I don't mean to scare you uh, that this is unnatural because this is, this is how Mother Nature reacts mm -hmm. and repairs itself. Now, fortunately, your parks... Um, uh, we, we mentioned moraine, there's nothing at the top of the bluff. And while the toe has experienced some damage, it is uh, by far looks pretty stable uh, of, of between uh, moraine and Millard. Now Millard did suffer uh, that, that failure down on, on the north end. And in fact, when we started looking at this at the beginning of 2020, before it failed, I didn't recognize that there was even uh, a big problem in that area, but the um, high water levels pulled the sand out of that, um, out of those cells very quickly and even exposed some historic shoreline protection works. There was a, a concrete wall that was exposed uh, that one we didn't know was there and was definitely put in as shoreline protection once upon a time. Now, as the water levels start to drop, that beach will come back in and will protect that that uh, that bluff again, because it is in a state of of um, 
of instability, then it will still, as I said, um, um, restabilize uh, surficially or or more um, or a larger uh, movement. This is what we are seeing throughout Illinois and Wisconsin, where we have bluffs. Your bluffs are very tall. <laughs> uh, as you know, they're about 70 feet in some areas. So that movement of those trees coming down and uh, it's much more visible, but believe me, this is happening um, along the shoreline and it will repair itself by, by falling, by uh, having some surface slips and uh, the water levels will, will return uh, to a more normal, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this conversation, they are returning toward normal, already down a foot and a half, so that's, that's good. Millard does have those walking trails on the top, which is, um, and, and I guess just because I've been thinking this the whole time of this conversation, the whole point of a putting together a beach management plan was exactly to highlight these issues. We have been very focused on Rosewood because of the amount of money that was put into it and because it is your most popular park. Uh, but the, the other parks do have some needs and uh, how high up the list of priorities those needs are, that's what this, this document was to, to highlight. Uh, Millard is very natural. There is that gazebo at the top. There are some um, uh, benches and trails. And uh, until a geotech analysis is done, we recommend you know, limiting uh, people walking in those areas or putting up signs that just say it's unsafe until you better know, uh, only because that is a, a highlighted area. But um, uh, even if moraine, let's let's use that as an example. If there was a bit of a bluff failure there, I, I, it, that doesn't bother me. That's natural. That's there's no damage or concern to safety in those areas. Um, so I, I guess that's kind of my answer. Is that uh, other other um, neighborhoods and and communities are also looking at this through the lens of we can't protect everything and let's make selective and informed decisions on how to approach uh, the, the difficulties that our bluffs and our beaches have experienced over the past year um, and, and put money where it's most needed uh, for in terms of public safety and continual uh, program use of these spaces. And, yeah, and thank you. I just, my last thing I just wanna say was I meant to lead off with this, but my, just the, my eyes were just turning red thinking about it just this might be the most important presentation we've had since I've been a board member. And uh, to have this spelled out, I think is just incredibly valuable and will give us a blueprint for moving forward. I'll feel a lot better now that we know the state of the entire lakefront from our standpoint. And I think I will uh, think of my job differently moving forward because of this. So thank you. Terry will have the new title. It's called Water Commissioner. Something. There you go. Brian, do you, uh, any questions? I, I'm sorry, Lori is next always. I apologize. Lori? Yeah, so um, one question I had that what stood out to me was you mentioned that the Army Corps of Engineers is not allowing groins in, uh, in beaches anymore. What, what is that? Can you give us more information on that? When we spoke to the Army Corps representative, they made it clear that they are no longer permitting the installation of new steel groins. That's not something they will allow under their permits. And so if the groins were to fail and you had to replace a groin, you'd have to use a different type of structure rather than a steel groin. You'd be looking at some other type of structure, a stone structure, stone revetment structure or something to that effect rather than a steel groin. And so what we're saying with regards to the groins is let's just start watching these. They're older. Um, in some cases, they're 50 plus years old. We need to just start um, being diligent about checking in on these things at least annually. You know, it's just like uh, going to the dentist two or three times a year. We need to just have this process of double checking on these, evaluating them, looking at them, determining if they need repair. And then if they, at some point they're, steel will, will erode in these environments. They're exposed to air and they're exposed to submersion. And so that's the right kind of environment in time it will erode and in time they will be need to be replaced. And we're saying, let's monitor that so we can kind of understand what 
how much is how much of the steel groins changing over an, a 12 month basis and then from year to year um, let's just kind of keep a track uh, keep an eye on these things and then as we start to see some groins starting to age out and we recognize that they are reaching the point where they're going to need to be replaced we can develop a plan for how we want to replace those so the reason i asked is that was uh, very fresh in my mind from rosewood because we put those steel groins in so did they explain or say why they're no longer permitting them wait 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 we didn't put steel groins in at rosewood what, what did we put um as far as the groins well there there were existing steel groins we installed the uh rock structures and that's why we pulled them out okay no yeah. we didn't pull them out no wait they we were didn't. never they're still there the groins at rosewood are buried well generally they're supposed to be buried under the right. sand under the rocks right and, under and the, the sand rocks. and the sand okay so my question again is why are they no longer permitting that is something wrong because oh, sorry. We do, let me have make them at our, we do have them at rosewood that was my concern let, let me make it more clear you can keep the groins you have what the Army Corps is not permitting is the installation of new groins. So if you had a groin fail and you had to replace it, they would not allow you to, they would not permit replacement of a steel groin with a steel groin. The but groins did that they you- they explain why that is? Why don't they no longer want steel groins? That's what I'm trying to understand. I, yeah. They didn't, they did not explain to us why they no longer. <laughs> and my, sus my suspicion is because it's a material that they, they don't want to, there's, there's issues with the material, but um, new in the future, they will not be permitting steel groins. That was what they shared with us and in our, in our interview with them and our okay. discussion with them. So okay, we, I got it. What I, think I can say about my uh, interaction with the Army Corps and even IDNR when it comes to uh, groins is they're considered embayment structures, which is exactly what you have in, in Rosewood. The idea is that it traps sand, it holds sand, it embays it. Um, what we have learned about groins uh, and any kind of embayment structure is that that means the sand doesn't end up downstream. So it causes starvation on the downdrift side of these structures. Because of that, the Army Corps and IDNR views them unfavorably because they are uh, basically starving your neighbors. And therefore they're very hard to permit. Um, it's not that they can't be permitted. I, I'm sure you went through a very rigorous process with the, the uh, Rosewood and had to go through a monitoring study. And I'm doing that on, on some of my other projects where we're using offshore structures, even though they aren't embayment structures. But groins particularly, that's their purpose. They're, they're made to stop sediment from moving. And therefore, like I said, they're not seen favorably and therefore it, you would have a very hard time permitting them because there are other shoreline protection systems that provide uh, stability without causing negative downdrift issues. So therefore they're, they're not permitting new ones. And Jay is exactly correct. You can repair the ones that you have. Um, you can even extend them further inland. What we saw in Millard is that they were, I don't wanna say overtopped, the erosion was back behind the stem of them. So now they're no longer holding anything because sand is actually moving behind them. Uh, those can be extended inward. Um, that will still require a permit, but it is an enhancement of a system that you already have. New groins are going to be very difficult to, to permit. Okay, got it, got it. I'm sorry, what I was, my concern was is that we, ours are fairly new, I thought in my mind. And was there an issue with us having them in there? But it sounds like there's not. So, no. okay, thank you. Um, Brian Kaplan. I will try to keep this short. One of my first thoughts when I heard this <clears throat> presentation was cost and what it's gonna cost us. But I think if I understand what the main purpose is, this was to tell us what we need to do to preserve our beaches. And Highland Park is first and foremost a beachfront community. And if you know, I'm being asked, do I want to move forward with these studies, then my answer would be resounding yes. But we have to do something with the studies. You know, we glossed over Moraine Park, but that's one of our four beaches that we don't have access to. So we, we've got to do something. Um, let's do the right thing. 
if, if you're asking me without re repeating what, what's been said, do we need to do these studies? Uh, my initial thought would be depending on the cost, yes. But I think even cost aside, yes. Those are my only comments. Questions, they're too numerous. There was too much to, to digest at one time. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I have no questions. I just want to comment that uh, I think it's Terry and everyone has put their fingers on it that highlighting these issues for us certainly was uh, successfully accomplishing the mission. As one of our presidents said, mission accomplished. So we, uh, we did, thank you. And obviously there's much for us to consider and to do. Do any, uh, any further questions uh, or, um, or should we bid adieu to our, our friends from the Smith Group? I think that's it, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. Speaking of speaking of lakefront issues, we'll go to the Park Avenue Boating Facility access gate. Since there still will be a Park Avenue, despite all the fears that we just were told about, uh, Director Smith. Thank you very much. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Oh, the beach looks nice. Perfect. So I'm going to provide an overview of the Park Avenue Gate project, and we'll be requesting consensus from the Park Board to proceed with this project. Uh, so this gate is proposed to be placed at the bottom of the hill as soon as a vehicle would turn right to head to the south portion of Park Avenue, which is the boat launch area. Um, so the purpose of the beach of the of the gate is to control vehicular traffic to that boat launch area and also to reduce the need for a staff presence right there maintaining access to that area. So this is this is an example of the type of gate that would be installed there and then this next photo shows the orientation that we would be uh, installing these gates. It would be two separate operators with two 14 foot arms that would open simultaneously. So this is the general area where the gate is proposed, uh, where you can see the do not enter signs. That's right uh, Park Avenue where a car comes down and then it would take a right hand turn to head to the boat launch area. So here's an aerial of, of that exact area. So the first thing we would do would we would install a small shed in the back corner of our north parking lot. That would house um, the operating system for the gate. It's where the internet would be based. And we would also um, pull power from an adjacent um, panel right there. So as a car would come down Park Avenue, there would be this card reader on the driver's side and that's how they would open the gate. Now, uh, pass holders would be given a card similar to what we have at our dog beach and they would just scan it on the reader. And the gate uh, would be right here. This is our preferred location for the gate. This gate um, in this location would minimize any backup if there was concern that if the gate is much further back, someone may not notice it and take a right turn prior to scanning and may cause some sort of a backup. And also this location provides the opportunity for someone to enter the north parking lot or to take a left-hand turn and, and exit the site. So the operators of this gate would be placed adjacent to the curbs, but in the existing roadway, there would be protective concrete bollards around each operator. And we did have an engineering firm conduct a turning analysis uh, to confirm that the gate could be placed here and would not negatively impact any vehicles that are coming through, including boats, towing trailers, as well as very large vehicles that occasionally have to uh, come to the waterfront. Now, this is an alternate location for the gate. Um, if we do need to move it. So gate location one requires footings. And once we move forward with this project, we'll be determining what the underground utilities are. And if there are utilities in the way, 
we would have to move the gate. This gate location to uh, is an area where we could install the gate and would not require footings because of the existing concrete. Now, these yellow lines here are indicating where we're gonna run uh, the power and low voltage to operate the gate. We'd be doing that through underground boring, so it would, would not be damaging the asphalt or anything like that. And we're also uh, planning now to uh, install security cameras somewhere in this area uh, to monitor the gate, uh, particularly if there's any damage to the gate. We'll also be installing some signage uh, to control reader to alert people to the gate and um, there'll certainly be a phone number if there's any issues that people will need to contact. And the gate is, in, um, is anticipated to be installed and operational by Memorial Day. So uh, kind of a brief summary of the operational sides of this gate. So the gate is proposed to operate from May 1st through October 15th, which is the um, the boat launch season. And when a boater purchases an annual pass, this is essentially the time frame that they're purchasing for access to that area. The, the gate will also, well, the city will also be given access to the gate. Obviously they have water plant employees right there, plus uh, fire police and other emergency vehicles will all have access to this area. And then if there are ever any issues, the, the system would allow us to open the gate remotely. And um, there's also a manual override where you can open the gate manually. If there's a power failure or a network failure and we need to leave the gate open. So currently we have annual passes available. We'll also be extending that to daily passes with the system. Now those daily passes would need to be purchased at the rec center and the patron would be provided a temporary card that would work for that day. The, the way we're setting this up, there would certainly be the option in the future to install a pay station similar to what we have at Rosewood if we so choose to. Now, um, I certainly wanna, wanna stress that the installation of this gate will not impact access to the North parking lot uh, that's adjacent to the recreational passive beach. Um, that parking lot is still available. Um, moving forward, all of our lakefront parking lots are going to require a, a lakefront parking decal, um, but that's all that patrons would need to access that parking lot. And it also will not impact um, pedestrian access to the site. Still, the entire site will be open. Uh, it doesn't change the use of the site. It's just a much more efficient and effective way to control the access that we need to control, seeing that we have pass holders that essentially pay to have access to that area of the site. Now, as far as the budget for the overall project, we have the gate system that I briefly talked about, and this is the cost for that system. And then um, this line item here is, is kind of a number of things. It's the um, some of the work we're gonna be doing in-house and some with contractors, where we'll be uh, getting the power ready, we'll be running lines underground, and we'll also be bringing in network. And then uh, there's the component of the access control. This would be the same contractor that um, does the access control for our dog park. And like I said, it's a very similar system. And then I mentioned that we are now uh, looking to install security camera. Um, security camera would cost um, at a maximum this amount, but likely to be less. So at this time, we're estimating the total project to come in at $62,849. And in the capital budget, we currently have $75,000 budgeted. So this presentation um, had recently been made to the finance committee and we received consensus from that committee to move forward with this. So this evening, both staff and the finance committee are recommending that the Park Board of Commissioners provide consensus for staff to proceed with this project. Uh, do I have any questions? Well, let's start with Cal Bernstein. Thank you. Thank you, President uh, Edinburgh. Uh, Jeff, um, can you, if I miss it, I apologize. Can you describe what the present conditions are there? Is there a gate presently there? No, no, I'll, let me scoot back real quick to the aerial. So there is a manual gate right here. Uh, I, I can't speak um, 
from an operational standpoint, how often it's used, but there is a gate right here. I believe last summer we were starting to use that gate and we had looked at the system with uh, kind of a padlock that was like a, uh, you can almost use your phone to unlock it. We were looking for an economical way to control access, but unfortunately that system did not work very well. And moving forward, staff had to monitor that all summer long. So last year, we had to have staff there to monitor that entry point. And under the current proposal for the gate, we're, it's, is it going to be necessary to have that staff member also present? Um, it'll certainly be a, a, a much lesser, uh, less present. I mean, there'll certainly be staff um, on hand early on in the gate to make sure it's moving um, smoothly. But the idea behind this is that we won't have to rely on staff the entire time to be there to check passes and let people go beyond that point. Now you mentioned there'll be pedestrian access. Is there also be bicycle access? So we're, we're looking closer at that. And it's certainly something we want to include in our discussions regarding the Park Avenue site planning. There is the sidewalk right here. So there's still certainly access, but we'll look closer at whether or not something needs to be changed with the sidewalk or other kind of path to make certain that we're encouraging um, cyclists to that area. So like, for example, like a fisherman who wants to, to fish there, he would, he would have to buy, he, assuming he has a decal, he would park in the north parking lot and then have to walk over if he wanted to, to fish over by where the barge is? Oh, that, that's correct. So the only people that would be able to have access south of the gate will be people who either purchase annual or daily boat passes. Uh, that's correct. I, I will say there is a parking pass for that lot as well. That's my next question. So what's the parking pass? Uh, Mitch, how much is that one? It, it, it's just, it's, it's really for those who bring their own, um, you know, stand up paddle or they bring their own kayak or they fish and they go there often enough. So it's, it, it but it is a, a, a pass for, it's like, it's like a launch pass. I think Mitch, do you know the price on that? Correct. It's, it's $140 for, for the pass. And, and you're correct, Brian, it would allow people, uh, fishermen, stand up paddle boarders, kayakers that don't store their boat there, put it on top of their car don't pull a trailer, and also um, yacht club members that are non-residents would need a pass to get to the yacht club, so they would be paying a, a fee for that pass as well. So what are yacht club members? Do, do they get access south of the gate? But with purchasing that uh, that decal for $140, yes. For the annual basis, so, okay. And otherwise, if the yacht club member does not purchase that, the yacht club member will have to park in the north parking lot then walk over to the uh, to the yacht club? That would be correct, yes. What about for rentals when you rent out the yacht club at night? What's the plan for that? You would you would receive um, temporary passes, something like a day access pass for during your rental time. They'd be activated for the start to the end of your rental. Okay. All right. Thank you. Barry? Uh, yeah, uh, so there's been a lot of talk about this um, on social media. So I just want to make sure, even though um, you've done a fine job of <clears throat> explaining it, I just want to make sure it's crystal clear. Um, so I just want to kind of go through the questions just a little bit. So why, why, again, do we even need a gate? Can you just say that to make it very clear? Sure, I'll, I, I will give my... Uh, answer and then I've, I'll certainly ask Brian and Mitch if they want to add anything. But the idea here is obviously we've been talking about there is a pass that has been sold and, it, and this is this is not a new thing to access that area during the boating season. And so obviously whenever you have uh, individuals that are paying for that, it, it's expected that the others can't get through there who haven't paid. So we have to control access and uh, it certainly is challenging to control that access and this is going to be a much more effective way to do it. Like I said last year, we essentially had a staff at all times down there having to manage that exact point. And so this will uh, greatly reduce the amount for our staff to, to be there at all times. Okay, great. Um, have we worked jointly with the boaters to create this uh, gate? Or is, was this our idea and we put that on the boaters? No, this was, this was a, a collaboration. And uh, in fact, uh, many voters in our Park Avenue working group uh, or in our other uh, meetings uh, suggested that we do this. 
Um, they know we uh, have um, challenges and costs that are associated with the system that we've uh, instituted for however many years it's, it's, been, it's been going on. Um, namely the past, I think, six years uh, since um, there were security issues raised in regards to the water plant. And um, so there had to be a, a uh, security guard placed at the bottom of Park Avenue before you turn right where the gate is currently going to be. We also, you know, we pay somebody almost 365 days a year to open that gate in the morning and close it at night so it can remain closed uh, for security reasons uh, overnight because the park closes at dusk. Uh, so uh, yes, they're well aware of, of this and, and they were a big, uh, very much, uh, they were proponents of it. Great. Um, what role does the city have in, um, in this idea of having a gate? Well, uh, their role in the idea of it, it really wasn't their idea. They used to um, provide the person at the bottom of the hill, uh, a police officer or, or a, a cert, if you will, um, who would uh, monitor the access control. And um, that responsibility uh, last year was um, uh, given back to the park district to do that. So um, we decided that uh, it would be we'd get a better long-term return on our investment by having a gate down there than paying a person indefinitely to, to monitor that area. And this was certainly heightened by the um, significant increase in usage and the significant increase in, in issues that we had at the lakefront uh, last year. Great. So, um and we worked hand in hand with the city on this entire project. Okay. Um, what role does the water treatment center play in us putting that gate there? So as Brian said, we've worked really closely with the city, including representatives from the plant there on doing this. And we are working with them where we're, they will be provided access so they can open it for all their deliveries. And we've certainly come to an, an understanding and agreement that this gate is not going to negatively impact them and they're comfortable with how we're moving forward with it. And my final question is, what, how does this change the, the basic nature? I was kind of following up on what Cal was asking. What is this? Hold on one second, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, what does this change the general nature of our, of our beach, the, the, the North Beach, the um, fishing, the um, boat launch, does this change it in any way? Could, if my name was Jack and I just lived in town and wanted to come down there, does this change my life in any way? I'm, I will, I'll start by saying it's my understanding that a pass was required for this area during the same time frame last year, every day of the week. Um, and so obviously, it's um, something we'd have to monitor, but it's so the need to pay for access to this portion of the property is not changing. Yeah, and I can help add on the, the so access to our North Beach and the passive recreation components to the North Beach doesn't change at all. Um, to Brian and Jeff's, uh, you know, just kind of add on, Pr prior to 2020, we always on Friday, Saturday, Sunday had to have someone down there because of the, the, the utilization and making sure that we had proper pass holders getting past that entry point. Um, in 2020, certainly things changed even beyond that where we needed to have that someone there seven days a week. But regardless, we, we do need some type of access control from 2021 and beyond. It may be more heightened on weekends for sure, um, but we'll always need to have some type of presence. The gate gives us certainly a lot of options. There will always be a, a presence, um, but if you know operationally we need to change things because utilization is, is a little bit lower and you know gaining access to the south area on a weekday 
um, because there's just not a lot of heavy utilization. We can always evaluate that. Um, but, you know, uh, if, if things were the same in 2021 as they were in 2020, we would want to limit the amount of access going to the, the south area because it was way too congested. And, you know, the, the North Beach was also congested. So, so it gives us a lot more options and we know we're gonna need some type of access control always in that area. Uh, and so operation that gives us a lot more options with, with that gate and, and it will reduce cost over time without having to have the staff person there. So just the basic differences is that Monday through Thursday, two years ago, I could have turned right, <clears throat> driven my car and parked near the South Beach and fished and enjoyed the beach over there. <clears throat> and now you cannot do that anymore. Correct, in 2020, that, that did change. Okay, thank you. All right, Lori. I do not have anything, thank you. Okay, Brian Kaplan. Yes, I just wanna follow up on a couple things. If, if I live up in the neighborhood and I come down Park Avenue to take a walk and I want to walk down by the beach area, this does not prohibit that in any fashion, correct? That is correct. And the cost it will pay for itself within a year or two because we will not have to have staff members down there doing the job at the gate. Correct? More like three, three, about three. But within a number of years, a short number of years, it's going to pay for itself. Correct. Eventually, yes. And is this something that we looked at other beaches that other beachfront communities have done using the same type of apparatus and security measures? Yeah, Mitch, I'll let you kind of... You guys are all shaking your head, but it's a verbal answer. Right? <laughs> I can say, uh, so we uh, have reached out to four communities. Three of them use this for boating. That would be Waukegan, um, Winthrop Harbor and Evanston. I have not heard back from them. I, you know, part of that could be they're a little bit less staffed right now, but I'm continuing to reach out to them. Uh, I did contact Wilmette, who actually uses this uh, at their their Pay Beach. They use a, a gate control system, uh, and their comments primarily were that um, you know to recommend definitely a camera because they have had some issues with with it getting hit and. and so that, that's really their, their main feedback. And then st statically, it's not going to be just some bland black gate. It's going to try to fit into the, the background. It's, it's essentially going to be the gate you saw in those images. OK, that's all I have. Thank you, Jeff and Mitch. OK. Welcome, Mitch. Thank you. I have no questions. I wholeheartedly endorse the project. Uh, I believe you have a consensus of the park board that we should move forward with this. Thank you very much. We'll now go, don't go away. Approval of Park Avenue Gate, non-exclusive special license, not a lease, agreement with the City of Highland Park. Director okay. Smith. Thank you very much. Yes, that's correct. This is this is a um, this is a license agreement. So, as we mentioned, we've been working closely with the city. This area of the property where the gate will be placed um, is owned by the city. So, we discuss entering into a license agreement so that we can place that gate there and operate it. So, in, in the board packet, the the license agreement that was there has been reviewed extensively by our legal counsel. Like I said, we've worked very closely with the city on developing this, and we've also run it by Paderma. So staff are recommending approval of this license agreement on the board. Uh, let's go and ask, is there a motion to allow Executive Director Roms to enter into the Park Avenue gate, non-exclusive special license emphasis agreement with the city of Highland Park? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the motion or the agreement? Hearing none. Roxanne, please call the roll. Commissioner Bernstein. Aye. Commissioner Grossberg. Yes. Commissioner Flores Weisskopf. 
Aye. Vice President Kaplan? Yes. President Ruttenberg? Yes, the motion carries. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is the review of vouchers. Uh, Director Peters to present, and I will start off by saying I have reviewed them and have no questions on the vouchers. Very good, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions on the vouchers? Hearing none. <laughs> and again, our sympathies go out to you and your family. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. We are now open to the public to address the board. Brian, do we have any indications? Hearing none, we will go to a motion to go into closed session pursuant to the following section of the Open Meetings Act, section 2C5, the purchase or lease of real estate including discussion on whether a certain parcel of property should be acquired. Section 2C6, the setting of a price for sale or lease of property owned by the district. And I don't have anything else highlighted, so that will be it. Is there a motion? So I'm going to close. I'll second that. All right. Uh, Roxanne, please call the roll. Commissioner Bernstein. Aye. Commissioner Grossberg. Yes. Commissioner Flor Weisskopf. Aye. Vice President Kaplan. Yep. President Ruttenberg. Yes. Also, the meeting is now adjourned into closed session at 7.45.